hey, we've got an awesome presentation coming up next. We've got using data clarity to inform your creativity. And this one is going to show us uh, all about how data and creativity don't have to be oppositional forces. And the best writing uses both personal and true and is also true to the broader facts. Um, so you got to be creative, but you also have to rigorously test what you're doing. So our best, our uh, data scientist, uh, John Foster, is going to be joining us with Colin Palmer. You'll remember Colin from yesterday. He's the director of undergraduate admission at the University of Toledo. And they're going to talk about how the right data can inform your creative efforts. Well, we'll leave you guys to your session. Thank you all so much. We'll be back shortly. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so welcome to our uh, session, uh, Using Data Clarity to Inform Your Creativity. Uh, I'm John Foster, Data Scientist at Capture. Colin, you want to say hi? Sure. Good afternoon or morning, everyone. Colin Palmer, Director of Undergraduate Admission at the University of Toledo in Northwest Ohio. Uh, so I'm going to start us off, uh, share some ideas about how creativity and data can work together, uh, then pass it off to Colin. He's going to give some real world examples about how his campus has used data uh, to drive you know, creative enrollment initiatives. Uh, so starting off with some good news, uh, we still need humans. So good for us. Uh, for example, uh, uh, starting off with... Um, what happens when AI try to be creative? Uh, this is from a book by this woman, uh, Janelle Shane. She's an AI researcher, and she took uh, a bunch of pickup lines and fed them to her AIs and then let them create new ones. Uh, so uh, the results are, are pretty interesting. Uh, one, one of the pickup lines that came up with is the title of her book here, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You, which is pretty good. So my, some of my other favorites are... Uh, I have exactly four stickers. I need you to be the fifth. Or, hey, my name's John Smith. Will you sit on my bread box while I cook? Or is there some kind of speed limit on that thing? And uh, finally, you have a lovely face. Can I put it on an air freshener? I want to keep your smell close to me always. <laughs> and as, as much as I would love to spend our whole time on this, uh, we'll probably move on. But the, the point is, we still need human creativity. Uh, because there, there are some things that, that uh, data and algorithms are good at and other things that humans are good at. And for those of you who caught our uh, excellent opening keynote speaker, you'll recognize that most of the things here on the right are, uh, you could, could categorize as, as being creative in some way. So one of the things that the data and algorithms are good at is finding complex patterns. Uh, so for example, uh, in our predictive models of, of apply, aid, and enroll, uh, they search through hundreds of variables and millions of combinations between those variables uh, to tell you know, which students are most likely to apply, uh, which students are most likely to enroll, and how much are students likely to respond to aid. Uh, and never in a million years would, we, would a human be able to sort through all of those, um, all those combinations of variables and find those complex patterns uh, and make a prediction to, with the same sort of accuracy that a machine can. However, uh, humans are good at discerning meaning from the pattern. Like, what, uh, what does this mean? Uh, you know, we're all tasked uh, with with coming up with you know why why does our school exist? Why does uh, why should a student apply or enroll at our school? What does it what does it mean for their for their life? Or um, you know, we can we can put down some quant quantifiable measures of you know increased income or whatnot, but also, you know, what do we hope that they will come out of here be, becoming? What sort of a person should they be when they graduate from our school? Um, they're also good at testing hypotheses, but still need a human to come up with a hypothesis, um, which, is, which is kind of inherently a, a creative task of, of, of making a hypothesis based on your observations of the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about how a, a school tested uh, tested the hypothesis that that email has an impact on inquiries uh, in a little bit. So hold on for those results. Uh, data and algorithms are good at measuring success. And uh, there's we get lots of data and lots of metrics, uh, but but it's up to us to define success. Which of those metrics matters? Uh, so an example here would be uh, with email. Uh, the, we used to measure with email, um, really opens, clicks, unsubscribes, the, the total number of those. 
uh, which is pretty common. But the, the, the more we thought about it and the, and the deeper we explored it, we, we redefined success to say, okay, actually, we're not interested in just maximizing opens and clicks. We're max, interested in maximizing the number of people that we actually have an impact on through opening and clicking. And so now we measure openers and clickers, so individuals who open or click. Um, and how you define that success will, will determine what actions you take to get there. Uh, machines are, are very good at automating repetitive tasks, um, things like sending millions of emails uh, and thousands of digital ads and uh, loading dynamic content that is, that is relevant to people as they, as they uh, explore your website. Those repetitive tasks, uh, you know, the machine is better. You, know, you don't want to be click and send every time you, uh, you need to send an email. But, you know, hopefully that frees people up to come up with new ideas. And people capture and at your campuses thinking of new, fresh, more impactful ways of talking about your school and of presenting that information. Uh, they're very good for prioritizing work. So, so much of the value that, that Capture gives is uh, in some, some scores that we give that, that can help you prioritize your outreach efforts. So uh, we have an engagement score, which measures how engaged is a, is a, a student right now on your website. Uh, we have an affinity score, which is how engaged have they been uh, overall time. And then we also have you know, an apply score, which says how likely are they to apply so you can prioritize your work, reach out, uh, send your direct mail to those students where it's going to have the most impact and phone calls, text messages. Uh, same thing for enroll, prioritizing out of your admits who's most likely to enroll uh, or at this time of year, who's most likely to melt. Uh, as well as who's going to respond to aid. So all of those things can help you prioritize your work, you know, hopefully, hopefully make you, you know, work smarter, not harder. Um, so that ultimately, ideally, you're going to spend more time doing what only humans can, which is forging human connections, right? Uh, having, having relationships with uh, prospective students, talking about them, about what matters to them, uh, about why, they, uh, what they want out of college and beyond. So, you know, hopefully we can free up some of your time uh, to, to do more of that. John, I have a, yeah. a mentor of mine who has a PhD in structural engineering, um, mm -hmm. so uh, very data-minded, um, a, a scientist. And, you know, he taught me that we want to make data informed decisions, not data driven yeah. decisions. Yeah. So I think that that that's a, just an anecdote I wanted to share and something that I take into my everyday work is we want to, we want to review and, and know what's available and the models are going mm -hmm. to create that for us. Yeah. Um, and we're going to use that to inform what we do next, but not necessarily drive each individual action that we take. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's nice. That's a good way to put it. Um, so speaking of kind of a, a data informed approach uh, to, to email, uh, did an analysis around what are the most effective subject lines and what are the most effective words and subject lines. So this would be, you know, some some examples of subject lines for email that that, you know, the data say should be effective. Uh, things like come join us for our open house April 13th uh, or your application is nearly complete. So these. Um, you know, they're, for one, they're tied to a specific action, usually a specific date. Uh, we find those sort of emails are, are very effective. Um, you know, I would say these are, are useful, uh, but a little bland. They're not, they're not the most exciting subject lines you've come up with. And sometimes, you know, data driven decisions can be, uh, you know, very, um, very utilitarian. But, you know, there's, there's a place for that. There's also a place to be more creative. Uh, so here are some subject lines. I've come across that would be more on the creative side. Uh, this top one came across is not from Capture, uh, but but it was an email that I saw, and uh, I'm sure they got I'm sure they got a good open rate on that. Um, the second two are from Capture, were from a, a reengagement campaign. So these were students who we'd sent a, uh, an entire series of emails. They hadn't opened or clicked any. You know, had, had shown no interest up to this point. So it was a point where we were willing to take a little bit more of a risk. So uh, decided to be a little more playful and creative uh, and come up with these subject lines, as well as the, the emails themselves. 
uh, were in a similar tone, uh, kind of playful or definitely playful. Um, the results from these were really, were really impressive. Um, uh, got like a 17% open rate, uh, and uh, several additional students who apply students that we've, you know, pretty much written off. Um, so, you know, the point is don't be afraid to be playful, try something creative and then come back and, and test it with data, measure it with data. Got a couple examples uh, along the same lines for, from Collins School. You know, a you know straightforward but effective email here of uh, complete your application, and then and then one that's, that's a little more creative, a little more personal uh, would be you know we'd love to show you campus. So a, a good place for 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 both of those tones, uh, one that's you know very to the point, uh, and another that's that's a little bit more uh, relationship building. Uh, so overall, I would say, you know, be creative and then test. Um, and, you know, one way to test is, is measuring against other content. That's, you know, the, kind of the easiest and most common, uh, you know, how did, how were our opens and clicks compared to, to the averages or other, other similar, uh, pieces of content. Um, but even better if possible is, is to experiment. Um, you know, and I say that, you know, if it's good enough for, for life-saving medical treatments, it's good enough for a postcard. Uh, you know, this is the way that we move forward in, in scientific knowledge of medicine. Uh, you know, when there's a, a new medicine or a new vaccine, um, you know, we set aside a random group of people that, that don't get the, that don't get the treatment. Um, so one random group gets the treatment. The other random group, you know, usually gets a placebo in, in a medical context. Um, and, and, uh, you know, if it's good enough for that, it's good enough for, for higher ed. You know, there, there is like this, this concern that, that if you don't send everybody direct mail, uh, then you're going to miss out on some people who you might have pushed toward application or, or, or further. Um, but, but you're also missing out on the knowledge. You're not, you're not sure if, uh, if that direct mail piece had an effect or, or how much of an effect it had. If you're able to run an experiment, then you not you know not only if it's effective, but just how effective. Um, and sometimes with an experiment, the answer uh, is it doesn't really matter. So um, you know, one example would be like an A/B uh, test of different dynamic content. Sometimes we found that it does matter. Sometimes we found that that the you know the subtle differences between the two don't really matter. Uh, you know, serving at at the right time maybe is, is more important than than actually what the piece of content is. Uh, the, and, and that's useful information. If, if it turns out that uh, one's better than the other, or if it turns out that, that they're actually, the, you know, essentially the same, then you know, then you know how to proceed. Um, I alluded before about something one of our schools did, which uh, was a pretty gutsy move. They, they did a, a holdout group. So they, they, you know, put us to the test in an experiment of uh of whether our, our email was going to take junior students and drive them toward inquiry uh so you know sometimes we we i don't know about we as capture but other people out there right say that you know we sent them email and they became applicants uh therefore the the email drove them to, to apply or inquire um the, when the truth is you know some of those students would have applied or inquired otherwise um, and so in running this experiment, you know, there were some some of the students from this random holdout group who did inquire, uh, but email drove four times as many inquiries. So so we knew not only that it was effective, but just how effective it was. Um, so this this is something that I would like to see more of in higher ed. I think I think we could we could benefit from. John, I think that uh, there's there are often three groups of three groups that you can put uh, prospective students into. The, those, mm -hmm. There are those that are never going to apply or enroll no matter what you do. There mm -hmm. are, are always going to apply and enroll no matter what you do, yeah. bad. And then there's that middle group. And the middle group is really the, the group that we want to influence. Sure. Most. And I mean, models can help us determine who those, um, who that, that, that best group is, those that are going to apply or enroll no matter what we do that yeah. to me would be an interesting group to do some a b testing with whether that's holding out some of them for a certain call to action or not or mm -hmm. 
developing, you know, um, a call campaign or an event invitation in two different ways or how you talk about certain things sure. that would be perhaps a group that you might have better results, more accurate results with. Yeah. If you go to that third group that you, you know, aren't going to probably influence no matter what, well, how are you really going to gauge your success if they probably weren't going to do what you wanted them yeah. to do in the first place? Yeah. And, you know, the reason we don't often is, is one, it, it is kind of scary. And, you know, two, it does take a, a fair amount of work. Uh, so, so, you know, there is, there is limits to how often you can do it, but, you know, as much as possible, I, I think is what we should be doing. Uh, so on a kind of a new topic here, um, combining the trend uh, with the individual. So this is, you know, a way that data and creativity can be friends. Um, so in my opinion, uh, much of the best art is both universal and specific. So I have a couple examples here. of uh, The Godfather being set in a very specific time and place, uh, very specific characters, uh, but addressing universal themes, family, loyalty, greed. Uh, Born to Run is very specific. You know, it talks, you know, Wendy, Highway 9, New Jersey. Uh, but the universal theme of just the restlessness of youth. Um, and the, so uh, these are things that we all can identify with. And the thing is, like, the specifics don't necessarily have to be my specifics. Uh, and it's true that representation matters. Uh, you know, we should be telling lots of different stories about lots of different types of people. Uh, but I don't have to be a teenager working in a factory in 1970s New Jersey to identify with Born to Run. Uh, it, is, it matters that it's, it's a specific story about a, about a person in a time and a place. Uh, and we're able to identify with them. Um, so I, like a lot of people you will meet, uh, I'm a former journalist. Uh, with the death, death of newspapers, there are a lot of us out there. Uh, in journalism, this is something we you know try to do uh, on a broader story, you know, find an individual who's been affected or who has a perspective on it. Um, I would say the best nonfiction writer, the person who does this the best, uh, in my opinion, is Michael Lewis. So if you look at uh, his, his books and the movies that are based off them, they're always centered around uh, an individual person. Uh, and used to explain broader concepts. So in Moneyball, uh, you know, centers around the manager, Billy Bean. It's played by Brad Pitt uh, and uses that to talk about you know, data heavy concepts of on base percentage and market inefficiencies. Uh, in The Big Short, it's centered around, among other characters, uh, Michael Burry, who's played by Christian Bale, uh, you know, and uses this as a way to discuss, you know, topics like short selling, credit default swaps, these big uh intimidating topics that are that are made uh much much more real and much more approachable by by centering them around an individual person so what does this have to do with uh with with higher ed uh, i find that the, some of the best commun student communication shares the same characteristics so uh, again from toledo you've got here that their accounting program has a 93 percent job placement rate uh, which is great but more memorable probably is the story from Jessica, uh, how she, how the accounting program prepared her for professional success. Uh, the, the, the two side by side, and, you know, the, the story along with the data, to me, like the data means that it's not just an isolated anecdote. Uh, you know, it, it has some validity, whereas the, the story makes it, makes it real and concrete. Um, you know, sometimes we, we try to st sell students on, the, the facts of our institution, so the student to faculty ratio, uh, the percent of students who get internships. But I would say as much as you can uh, to wrap that individual story, uh, you know, wrap that in an individual story of a student who feels at home because of small classes or uh, the student who had, you know, their dream internship last year. Um, you know, the decision to go to college is, you know, it's both rational and emotional. Um, you know, and as much as we can, can tie into both of those uh, I, I think that, you know, the, the more effective you're going to be. Uh, so now, you know, I've done plenty of talking. I'm going to turn it over to, to Colin. Uh, let him talk about how he's put some insights into action. Sure. So I'll, I'll provide a, a brief moment of context around our relationship with Capture. And we've used, um, you know, CBE and behavioral engagement data and platforms for 
quite a while now, um, since before my time here, but um, since becoming director at Toledo, we've brought on the apply model and now the enroll and aid model. So I find I'm, I'm looking forward to using that next year, um, but I want to talk a little bit about predictive modeling um, and just recognize first that paralysis by analysis is certainly something out there. Um, John probably comes as no surprise to you. That term comes from that same mentor, um, analysis by analysis. So there's a lot of information available to us and I'm partnering with Capture to bring on more and more, right? So more, more data points, more, um, things for John and his team to do to provide to the university of Toledo to help, um, you know, inform our strategy. But what I what I enjoy about it is, is it combines historical enrollment data and behavioral engagement data to really um, provide a more meaningful and accurate score for the students that we're trying to work with. So at Toledo, I know, you know, our prospect pool is growing um, exponentially each year. We're investing a little bit more in search and just name acquisition, whether that's through traditional means like ACT, College Board, and RCCUA, or something a little bit different um, with, you know, SCORE, Navient, um, Niche, whatever whatever that might be. So we're, we're, we're building that top end of the funnel, and we're using that data to inform our strategy. So one example, last year, we sent a prospect to inquiry mailer is my kind of internal name for it. And what we really wanted to do was drive traffic to our website to build strength in the model. So we had our prospects, um, let's say there were 150,000 of them. We sent this piece and it had a QR code on it. I know that was, I, I felt kind of, um, that was I think before menus even starting started uh, having QR codes. <laughs> so I think that our marketing team was like, are QR codes even a thing anymore? And now we're all, I think, accustomed to them again. Um, but what we wanted to do was put that into their hands, put it in front of them, and then drive traffic to our website so we could identify more visitors, so we could begin to collect um, more information about them and really begin to convert a lot of those prospects into inquiries. And why do we want to do that? You know, why, why was that a big part of the strategy? Well, I think a year ago, we were all very unsure and concerned about our ability to convert prospects to inquiries. We weren't going to be in high schools. We weren't going to have opportunities to attend college fairs. And so we had to think of creative ways to do that, but also reinforce our model. So as we move through the funnel, we were able to really allocate the limited resources that we had to put relevant and timely information in front of students that needed it. And that's what our goal was. We knew our pool was so large. We had our goal of our class that we wanted to enroll, but I knew that if I wanted to, you know, have 15,000 applications, 10,000 applications, whatever, I couldn't continue to mail things to 150,000 students. And we really had to use um, the data to think creatively about how we were going to do that. And I mentioned, you know, the desk, well, I mentioned the model, the apply model and using the different deciles. And the question is, well, do I, um, do I, reach out to those um, 40,000 students in the 10th decile because they have a 44% chance of applying to Toledo? Or do I really try to increase those nines to, to apply and engage with the institution? And so we, you think about the varying resources, resources that you have and, and how you're going to, you know, um, allocate those in order to make the movement that you need to make. Another thing we did is um, we were fortunate at Toledo to really bring back on-campus visits um, sooner than a lot of our peers in Ohio, but may, um, perhaps nationally, I've been back on campus five days a week since June 22nd of last year, so my my anniversary is coming up. Um, but what we realized is that, like most of us at, in higher ed, you know, the campus visit is one of the strongest predictors of a student's likelihood to apply and enroll. Um, as a regional institution, we draw a lot of our students from within 100 miles of campus. But I think what we all, uh, another challenge we face is students that live locally often think they know more about our institution than what they actually do. And so we're seeing lower campus visits from that group because a parent may have attended the university, an older sibling, a teacher, what have you, they might've attended a camp here. Well, they don't really know it in the way that we want them to know it. And so we're like, okay, well, how do we, how do we think creatively about how to get local students on campus? 
therefore um, putting that into the model and to our to to really strengthen that and have a better idea of their likelihood to enroll. So that way, if we have financial aid late into the season, how do we leverage that? How do we um, direct our student telecounselors? And so we're like, well, I don't think a normal daily visit is going to get a local student on campus. They've had that opportunity at Toledo for decades. So we scheduled some behind the scenes tours. A lot of fans in Toledo are, are a lot of people in Toledo are fans of rocket football, rocket basketball. So we're like, okay, well, we're going to schedule something in the evening. We're going to have food trucks. We're going to meet in front of the football stadium and we're going to go to the roof of the press box. We're going to go into the basketball locker rooms. We're going to go to the roof or the fifth floor of the library. And we're going to do those. Types fun, of yeah. Yeah. And, and walk people around. And we knew that in order to get them here, that's what we were going to have to do was to make something different and unique. And we did that with pets. We did a dog tour, a lawn tour of the university where we gave out um, little bandanas that said future admission ambassador on them to tie on dogs. We had dog treats. And that was just a, a great way to engage with the community and build awareness and build affinity with the institution. And so all of those things, driving the visit, driving the registrations, helped um, us in our final, you know, yield efforts as we're looking into kind of wrap up the, the entering class for the fall. Yeah, cool. And uh, I think I think it's what we had to present. I mean, I think we're open for, for, for questions and discussion. Hey guys, thanks so hey. much. Oh my gosh. And Colin, thank you for being an incredible panelist yesterday and coming back and sharing all of these amazing insights of the work that you guys were doing. Can we talk for a minute about the dog tour? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So the dog tour was not my idea. I, I will admit that. Um, our The person in my office, Andy, who manages our campus visits is a passionate dog mom. And we have... Uh, throughout COVID been a little more flexible with folks bringing their pets to work. And so Dobby, um, Andy's dog has spent some time on campus and we were like, well, wouldn't it be cool if we did something directly for pets? And we have an, um, an amazing neighborhood right across the street from our campus. We engaged the neighborhood. We put, we did targeted social media in that neighborhood. We um, invited our faculty and staff friends and, you know, how much did that really influence our yield or increase deposits? I don't know, but I'll tell you what, it sure as heck was fun. Um, the dogs were cute. We had about 40, 45 of them on campus. And it was really cool to just walk around um, the the campus for, you know, an hour on a, on, a, on a Wednesday evening. Yeah, and a time when we all could use a little bit of fun, right? Exactly, exactly. I, that behind the scenes tour sounded pretty cool yeah. for me. I mean, <laughs> that's not an experience even probably a lot of your active students would ever get to say they had. So that's really cool. Absolutely. You know, Colin, you talk about reconnecting with the local community, and I think it's uh, an important point because uh, when we work, we're working with a lot of institutions that are using the phrase think local, in part because of the pandemic, students want to feel a connection, perhaps closer to their home than what we have traditionally seen amongst American high school to college age students. So can you share with us, you know, based upon some of the data that you've noticed look like these that performed better than you thought? Len, you cut out for just a minute. Can you just repeat the question, please? Can you think of some of those think local activities that you've implemented that have performed better than you thought based on the data? And why do you think they perform so well? Sure. So when I looked at um, National Student Clearinghouse data after Census Day of fall 2020, like probably most other institutions, we saw more students in our funnel that didn't enroll anywhere at all than what we'd seen in the past. Not a huge surprise um, given the challenges associated with COVID. And we found that a lot of those students were from the greater Toledo area. And so we used that to really develop um, outreach strategy to partner with local CBOs focused on, you know, higher education attainment, um, community-based organizations focused on that kind of work. We did that to communicate about, um, you know, funding college opportunities. 
And so it was a really great way to just engage members of the community to just support college attainment in general. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy that at Toledo, we have such a strong relationship with our local community college and really approached that work together because we all recognize what's good for us is good for the community. But I also know at Toledo, what's good for Owens Community College is good for the University of Toledo. And so we um, partnered together and, and saw some movement there. And actually, um, our adult transfer, not, I'll say just non-traditional student populations for the fall are stronger than I would have anticipated. And I believe we're going to see some enrollment increases in a lot of those areas. Uh, Colin, uh, Kate over on YouTube has asked if you have any endeavors for adult learners to bring their kids to campus. We, that's next. Yes. So we, you know, a couple of years ago, we started printing crayons and, you know, Rocky and Roxy cutouts to have available at our events, but recognizing that those are often in the middle of the workday. So we have transitioned a lot of our events to the evening hours, especially for more uh, non-traditional students, but really being able to engage them. One of the things that we're doing this year is partnering very closely with the Division of Student Affairs and playing a more active role in Family and Sibs Weekend um, at Toledo. So I think we'll be able to see some opportunities there to help us inform our strategy moving forward, but just um, connect with children, families, and that kind of thing throughout the process. That's awesome. Uh, the concept of A-B testing and um, uh, creating communications that matter, right, uh, and that work um, can be a really complicated process. Um, Colin, as you and your team have endeavored to to explore, right, how best to, to communicate effectively uh, with prospective students, what are the two things that you have learned the most from all of the experimentation that you may have done? Sure. I, you know, I think it, A-B testing is um, a little challenging to think about. I, the thing I find most challenging is finding the time to set aside the research and build your hypothesis and ask sure. the question that you want to ask. That's the hardest part. <laughs> um, but what we've... In there are two different things that I think about. I think about affinity building messages to build an emotional connection with the university. And then I do think about those transactional mess, the transactions that we want students to take. But how do we talk about those and encourage that behavior um, without saying, here's five bullet points when you've been admitted, log into your student account, submit your enrollment deposit, submit your housing, you know, those types of things. And so we've we've done a little bit of that in that regard and the jury is still out on the success because that really just started this year. What we've done a lot of AB testing for though is event attendance. And so we've developed different invitations to different, you know, direct mail pieces or emails. And we've, done it just by showing different photos, you know, put a photo on this one and a photo on this one and see how the, the attendance goes. Um, so I don't have a direct, like one was more successful because I'd have to show you and I don't have them handy. Um, but those are some of the things that we've done mostly in the, the next steps, the transactions that the, what we're trying to do is influence behavior, you know, that we've yeah. talked that a little bit and then event registration. Absolutely. So we have one last question, I think, in time before we head into our final keynote of the, the conference. Uh, the comment from a user out on YouTube, UT has done a great job integrating and branding their messages in Northwest Ohio and Southern Michigan. Clearly someone who's informed. Well, um, what's the plan to move and find other pockets of future rockets? Oh, wow. Well, we, um, you know, we are looking at markets outside of Ohio. We had zero regional recruiters uh, 18 months ago, and we're up to five and uh, possibly a sixth already. So we're definitely thinking about that. But also we found um, just divvying up 
other markets amongst our staff, whether they're in Toledo or our regional staff, and paying very specific attention and inviting them to events specifically for them is important. I mentioned this on the panel yesterday, but we held a virtual information session just for students from Texas or from Florida and Georgia mm-hmm. and had 17 students attend. And to have 17 students from those two states attend an event for the University of Toledo is, is big news. <laughs> so um, I think that that really really work. So thinking about just building the, thinking about the smaller communities that exist within our pools of hundreds of thousands of students yeah. and building those connection points is what's been most important. That's fantastic. Well, John, Colin, thank you both for an awesome session and some really great takeaways to think about uh, as we continue beyond Innovate. All right. Thanks, Heather. Have thank fun. you.